Good evening and welcome. My name is Mark Guerin and I'm the director at the Institute of Politics here at the Harvard Kennedy School. And we're delighted to welcome you to the JFK Junior Forum and the 30th annual Theater H. White lecture on press and politics. We're very grateful to our colleagues uh, at the Shorenstein Center on Media Politics and Public Policy for hosting uh, an outstanding guest lecturer this evening. Pulitzer Prize winning columnists and the associate editor, Eugene uh, Robinson. With the presidential election just less than a week away, uh, we're fortunate to have this opportunity to hear from Mr. Robinson with his lecture entitled, Challenges Facing the Media on November 3rd and Beyond. Gene will offer his remarks and engage in conversation with the director of the Shorenstein Center, Nancy Gibbs, who herself brings considerable experience of her own to this conversation as the former editor-in-chief of my magazine. This has been a busy day at the Institute of Politics and our JFK Junior Forum. We had an earlier forum at noon today with Peter Sands from the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis and Malaria in conversation with Atul Gawande, discussing the issues of how do we contain uh, COVID-19 and how do we catalyze global leadership in that regard. But tonight we turn to the important questions of press and politics. At the Institute of Politics this semester, we've had a Everyday Counts campaign where we have opportunities for our students and community members every day to engage in conversations like this, to have exposure to ideas from guest speakers in the forum, to our fellows and study groups, and certainly our important work of voter participation and engagement with Harvard Votes Challenge. And we take this opportunity to remind everyone to vote uh, and to execute their plan to vote before next Tuesday's election. And we hope you'll join us back here in the forum on Thursday, November 5th, after the election, where the forum title will be, What Just Happened? Where we welcome Republican and Democratic strategists to discuss the results of the election. Karen Finney, Scott Jennings, Alice Stewart, and Robbie Mook. So with our thanks to the Shorenstein Center or with our excitement, uh, for today's lecture um, of someone who I've admired his uh, written word for, for many years. I turn it over to my colleague, Nancy Gibbs. Thank you and welcome. Thank you, Mark. And let me join in welcoming all of you to this 30th annual Theater H. White lecture named for the incandescent journalist who was both an architect of modern campaign coverage and uh, one of the inspirations behind the Shorenstein Center itself. He brought both great joy and fierce curiosity to his journalism. There is no excitement anywhere in the world short of war, he wrote, to match the excitement of an American presidential campaign. These many years later, we're coming to the end of a race that has felt all too often a little too much like a war. And even once a winner is known, there will still be immense challenges in front of us to grasp what brought us here. I am haunted by questions Teddy White asked 40 years ago in a memoir that searched for the connection between American power and American purpose. How had America come to this strange time in its history, he asked. How had the old pieties and the new technologies come to this strange intermarriage in politics? I can't think of anyone I would rather hear from at this moment than Gene Robinson, the Pulitzer Prize winning associate editor of the Washington Post. He won his Pulitzer for his columns on the 2008 campaign. I would happily nominate him for another one for what he has written this year. What kind of people are we, he asked in a scorching column as he drilled into all kinds of injustices that we see in front of us. But in another column more recently, he offered hope for the coming days. We can reclaim our serenity, our equilibrium, our sense of common humanity, he wrote. We can at least try to revive the concepts of fact and truth. Remember those old friends. He is a journalist's journalist, a deep, sane voice in unsettling times. As his Washington Post colleague, David Vondrely, wrote to me this morning, Gene has seen too, so much, pondered deeply, and testified with impeccable clarity. He's too young to be a legend, 
but too great not to be. Friends, please join me in welcoming back to Harvard, Eugene Robinson. Well, Nancy, thank you so much. Thanks so much for that uh, over generous uh, in, uh, invitation. Um, and, uh, and, and thanks to everyone. It's lovely and wonderful to be back at Harvard, even virtually. Um, I, my fondest memories are of my Neiman year at, at Harvard, and it is uh, a true honor uh, to give the T.H. White uh, lecture, especially this year, especially in this year of overlapping apocalypses. Um, I, I do believe that somehow we're going to make it through 2020. Um, uh, we'll probably have a plague of locusts and an asteroid strike before it's done, but, but I think we'll make it through. Um, but don't hold me to that. I do at least get to spend this next hour um, without my trusty mask, which I do wear uh, everywhere, um, uh, contrary to what uh, White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows might think. People actually do wear masks. So <clears throat> the, the title we chose for this lecture is The Challenges for the Media on November 3rd and Beyond. Um, one alternative title that Nancy and I batted around was Lord, please make it stop. And that's kind of what this year has, has felt like. Um, but uh, challenges faced by the media is, is, is more than enough to keep us occupied um, uh, for the time we have together. And in fact, I could spend a lot longer than an hour just talking about the economic challenges that face the media now and in the future and how we somehow are going to manage to survive uh, the collapse of the business model that media long depended on based on advertising revenues. We've all got to find different ways of making money now and we're not all gonna survive. Um, and that has deep and, and lasting and harmful impact, I think, on our society. Um, but we could talk about that endlessly, and we'll talk about that another day. I want to talk tonight about um, the, the challenges to our core mission. Um, our job is to be heard and to be believed. And my question tonight is, how can we do that? How can, can we do that today? And moving forward. How can we be heard and how can we be believed? Um, as you all know, we now every day make our way through a dystopian landscape of weaponized disinformation, uh, something the likes of which George Orwell never could have imagined. Uh, the information revolution and the rise of social media disrupted the media's role as gatekeepers. And this comes as no surprise to, to any of you. Now, it's hard, it's, it's hard to remember, but not so very long ago, we actually had a set of rules and a set of guardrails. And those rules and guardrails kept our public discourse um, more or less tethered to objective truth or at least objective truth as nearly as we could discern it. Um, first of all, we had a common chronicle of events, right? We could agree on what happened yesterday. Um, you know, the old hackney definition of, of news, right, is that news is not dog bites man, news is man bites dog. But there was a time when we could all agree when a man did indeed bite a dog and, and, and we could record that. And then we could argue about what that meant. You know, who was the man? What kind of dog was it? Did he really bite him, you know, or it? Um, and, but we agreed that it happened. Uh, and we, we kind of agreed where and when it happened. Um, and and um, that was, that became, part of our common chronicle of events. Um, we also had a common encyclopedia of facts, right? So that when scientists told us 
the sky is blue, or at least appears to be blue because of the way sunlight is refracted by the atmosphere, we believe them. We accepted that as an established fact. And again, we could sort of talk about that fact and know that it's not always blue, sometimes it's other colors, but, but we agreed that the sky was blue. Well, we in the media are we're kind of the enforcers of these rules and these guardrails that kept us tethered to this common chronicle of events and this common encyclopedia of facts. And so we would tell people what was true and what was false. And that is, what, in fact, what we still do. Um, but today, our voices are, are easily and dangerously drowned out um, on the internet um, by voices that are not even remotely tethered to fact and not remotely tethered to actual events. Um, so now every day, every human being really has a choice. They can open up their laptop or, or look at their phone and they can believe what they're told by the Washington Post, which has a thousand professional journalists working as hard as they can uh, to ascertain truth and to deliver it to you in a in a comprehensible way, um, uh, as as efficiently and lively prose, and uh, and with as much accuracy as possible, so they can listen to the post, or else they can believe, you know, your crazy QAnon cousin, who actually firmly believes that Donald Trump is saving the world from a giant cabal of satan satanic pedophiles. Um, you can believe either one of those things. It's totally your choice now. Um, and so when I say that disinformation has been weaponized, I'm not just talking about crazy people. I'm talking about people who are not crazy, but who have malign intent and who weaponize information for a specific purpose, often a specific political purpose, uh, who know exactly what they're doing and who know exactly how to do it. And so we saw an example just last week with the 11th hour appearance of the um, Hunter Biden laptop from hell. Um, this information, if it can be called information, was obviously very deliberately withheld um, uh, to be presented as a, a certain interval before the election, but right before the election, certainly not after the election. It was meant to influence the election. Um, was it entirely a concoction of Russian intelligence? Um, was it a concoction um, somehow cooked up by Rudy Giuliani and Steve Bannon? doesn't really matter. It was put out there. There were outlets that were willing to showcase it. And so thanks to the New York Post and Fox News, largely, it, it has indeed become part of the public discourse. Some people have chosen to believe it. Other people have not. The reputable news organizations that have attempted to ascertain whether there's any truth or news value in, or any anything uh, in the supposed laptop from hell have been trying to get their hands on this alleged hard drive. And for some reason, it hasn't been produced. So therefore, um, responsible news organizations in general have not gone with, this, with the story. But of course, uh, again, on your phone, it, it matters, but it doesn't matter as much as, as it should um, that only a few news organizations with a sort of, um, uh, for ideological reasons, are going with the story.
So the challenge, specifically when we're talking just about November 3rd, the challenge for us on election day is to let people hear and believe what we're telling them about the election results. They have to hear it and they have to believe it. Now, the evening of November 3rd, they, there may well be a red mirage. It may be the case that same day election results, um, same day, the results from same day voting, which we believe from what we know about early voting, um, which we believe are likely to be favorable to President Trump. Um, it may be that those same day voting results are reported before the absentee and mail ballot totals, which are more favorable to, to Joe Biden, um, are, are added into the, the totals. And so it may appear at first that Donald Trump is leading and has a substantial lead. So if that does happen, our job clearly is to tell people that this mirage is indeed a mirage, that it might actually turn out to be reality, but we don't won't know that until more of the votes are, are counted. And we'll have to convince our readers and our viewers to be patient until all the votes are counted. That will be a tall order. Um, it is possible that the opposite, in fact, could happen. Um, or something close to the opposite. Joe Biden, for example, might win Florida, say, which is expected to count all of its votes pretty quickly. It's got a lot of experience uh, in counting um, uh, uh, absentee ballots and mail-in ballots. Uh, so they can probably do that efficiently. And so the, the sort of follies of the 2000 election notwithstanding, most people expect Florida to have a count, a pretty good count on the evening of November 3rd. Well, if Joe Biden wins Florida, um, a lot of people are gonna be tempted to say, well, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's done and dusted. That's, that's it, there's no way Trump can win. But Florida doesn't really tell you all that much about what's happening in say Wisconsin and Michigan and Pennsylvania. And while the polls show Biden doing very well in in all those states, certainly in Wisconsin and Michigan, and 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 with a smaller lead in Pennsylvania, um, we all know how that can work out because um, uh, we saw it happen in 2016, and uh, and some of us still have uh, the psychic scars from that. Um, so it'll be incumbent on the media to resist jumping to any sort of uh, conclusions of, of, about Biden's prospects as well. So we have to be very clear on both on November 3rd and the hours and days that follow about what is known about the vote totals and what is not known. Um, and we, we somehow have to be heard above the cacophony of voices that, uh, perhaps including the very loud voice of President Trump himself, who are just gonna be telling lies. I mean, let's face it, they're going to be telling lies about the vote totals um, and we have to be ready for that. So <clears throat> I think we need to keep three things in mind. I think, I think we're going to need to do three things that in a very real way, play against all of our instincts, all, all play against the way we were taught to do journalism and, and that, 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 that sort of violate what we once thought were the sort of precepts of, of, of how we do our jobs. Um, first of all, I think we need to be loud. I think we need to be um, loud, bordering on obnoxiously loud. Uh, in saying what we know and what we don't know. Um, uh, and, and second, I think we need to be repetitious about it. Um, definitely repetitious to the point of obnoxiousness. And, um, and finally, I think that we, and by we, I mean responsible news organizations, uh, you know who you are. Um, I think we need to work together in defense of truth. And as I said, none of this really comes 
naturally to us. It's uncomfortable um, for us to be too loud and insistent. Um, uh, I've been at the Washington Post since long, long before most of you were born. Uh, and uh, one um, uh, longtime great managing editor of the Washington Post named Bob Kaiser um, uh, used to uh, say uh, that, that every story we printed should give the reader one clear shot at the facts, right? Just give them the facts, not um, no hyperbole, no hype, no nothing. Just let's give them the facts. And then we can, you know, go off on our tangents or whatever else we, we need to do. But but one clear shot at the facts. And and basically we thought that was our job. That was enough. I, I don't think we can um, uh, I don't think we can do that anymore. I don't think just saying uh, on election night, here's where things stand, using our sort of detached, carefully objective anchor man from nowhere voices. Um, I, I don't think that's good enough. And I certainly don't think we can use our sort of ingrained both sides equal weight convention, the, the, the news convention that we grew up with. The Biden campaign says that most of the votes remain uncounted while the Trump campaign says the president has already won. Well, both those things are not true. And so both those things should not get the same weight and they should not be treated as two sides of, of, of some imaginary coin. It's, uh, you know, if we know that one side is telling the truth and the other side is lying, we need to tell people that. And we need to tell them that plainly and clearly and loudly. And we need to say it over and over and over again because repetition works. When a lie is told over and over and over again, it begins to seem true and that is wrong and that is unfair and, it sh and that should not be the case, but it is the case. And we have seen it uh, with President Trump time and time and time again. How many times does he say, I built the best economy that America has ever seen? Well, that is just subjectively not true. It, it, it's not true that he built it. Um, he, he built on what the Obama-Biden administration had already done. Um, uh, and it's not true in, a, in, in any event that it was the best in American history. It's just not true. But he says it over and over and over again. And a lot of people believe it. Um, and, and, and I've seen stories that just sort of use that quote in reputable publications that sort of use that quote without challenging it. Um, and, if, and when we do that, we sort of accept the lie. So we need to challenge lies every single time. And, when, and so as we write our stories and as we do our commentaries, we need to do so in a way um, uh, that, that not only does not accept lies, but that does not repeat lies in a way that even as we try to discredit them, gives them wider currency. Um, that's a difficult thing to do, but it's not impossible. And we really need to work on ways of doing that. We can't aid and abet the spread of lies. Uh, and, and, and not doing so has to be a top priority for news organizations, uh, both on election night and beyond. Um, and then the sort of most uncomfortable thing is that I think we need to work, to work together more. And that's really unnatural. Um, we are competitors. You know, the Washington Post always wants to beat the New York Times. And the New York Times always wants to beat the Washington Post on every story. Um, that is in our bones. 
and that is in our blood. Um, but it is the case that news organizations do in fact work together in any number of situations. Um, at the White House, for example, the White House pool um, works together, not the entire White House press corps can, can attend every event or be with the president all the time. So there are pool reporters who, who attend uh, and there's a rotation of who's in the pool and pool reporters share all their the information they gather with the entire White House press corps. Um, um, the television networks have traditionally always worked together on election night to fund um, uh, to, uh, join resources to, to, to pay for and, and uh, exit polling, um, which they all share, which they all agree not to release until a certain time, um, et cetera. I remember when I was uh, Washington Post bureau chief in, in, uh, in London, um, there was a, uh, an oil spill in the Shetland Islands, which are off the Scottish coast, um, actually off actually closer to they're way up in the middle of the north sea closer a lot closer to oslo norway than to london england um but uh, there was an oil spill up there and so i flew up there and so did one of the new york times correspondents who's a guy named dick stevenson um and uh and i remember um uh so here we are competitors on the story um but there came there was a day when uh, there were Two events happening simultaneously. Some information was going to be released downtown, uh, if, to the extent there was a downtown in the Shetland Islands, and out at where the oil spill was, um, uh, uh, there was a tour for reporters to actually take a look at, at the wreck. Uh, and so we decided to join forces. And one of us went out and one of us stayed, and then we shared all of our information. This sort of thing actually, actually happened. So it's not completely alien um, to us. And um, if we truly believe in our mission, and if we believe that mission is providing truth, and if we feel, if we fear that some actors are going to try to hijack the truth on election night, then we need to work together to prevent that from happening. Now that's election night. Looking beyond, I think that, that these, uh, unnatural feeling measures of being insistent and being loud and being repetitious and working together need to be continued as we continue to fight the forces of, of disinformation. Um, I think, um, uh, and because of the new and alien nature of the media landscape, we can also enlist and make use of, or at least make use of, of, of allies and odd belt bedfellows. It's a fascinating story just today in Business Week about how in June, after the murder of George Floyd, uh, a group of white supremacists began flooding Twitter with tweets um, uh, full of misinformation about Floyd and about the police officer and about what happened. Um, with the hashtag White Lives Matter. Well, it turns out, according to Business Week, that those tweets were soon swamped and outnumbered by counter tweets that were coming from devoted fans of the K-pop band BTS, uh, who uh, it turns out are a surprisingly organized and effective uh, internet army uh, and they saw this happening. And so they sort of grabbed the White Lives Matter hashtag on Twitter and used it to tweet videos of their favorite K-pop bands, uh, thus ending the, um, the white supremacists uh, attempt at making a big splash. Um, so uh, even if we can't um, officially work uh, arm in arm, uh, with the K-pop bands, uh, we can at least salute and welcome their contribution to defending truth over falsehood. Um, in short, I think we need to treat this moment and the situation like the existential battle that it is. We are at war and we need to act like it. 
Um, I wish I could say I saw this as a short engagement or just a, a brief clash, but but I can't. I I think this is going to take us some time. Um, but I do believe, and I have to believe, that well-reported, reliable information ultimately wins the war. Um, that that ultimately quality will defeat um, uh, quantity, especially if it's if it's truth versus falsehood. Um, but we won't win this war without fighting for truth as hard as we can. Um, and we can't bring a knife to a gunfight. We have um, we have a lot of resources, um, and we got, have to use them like like we mean it. I really believe that if we persist, the fringe will eventually be forced to retreat to the fringe where it belongs. Um, one thing we can do immediately, though, to help that process is to stop pretending that crazy lies have any truth in them just because someone important is telling those lies. Um, and we need to have a very thick skin because if we are loud and if we are repetitious and if we are insistent and if, heaven forbid, we actually talk to each other about what we're doing, uh, we're gonna get a lot of criticism uh, and, and, uh, and, and uh, those, the forces of dis disinformation are going to howl. But we should never be afraid or ashamed to advocate for truth. Um, uh, it is a daunting road that lies ahead. Um, but I think news organizations have one enormous advantage, and I think ultimately it is a decisive advantage, and, um, and that is that truth is our superpower, and so we just need to use it. Um, and with that, I will thank you again for, uh, for inviting me to join you tonight, and I will, um, uh, Nancy, if, uh, if you'd like, we can, we can have some questions. Uh, Jean, thank you so much. You gave us so much to think about and, um, and, and work with. I love especially the fact that you drove right at the habits that need breaking and the actions that may be uncomfortable for journalists to think about. So I'd, I'd love to start there. Um, one of the great things about your rich experience at the Washington Post was that you've been a city editor, you've been a foreign correspondent, as you say, you've been a foreign editor. Um, and a columnist for the last four years. So you have lived both sides of the church state news editorial mm -hmm. divide. And especially these last months, we've seen within newsrooms, we've seen the kind of conversation that you're talking about occurring mm -hmm. uh, among journalists about our purpose and responsibility. And, and on the editorial floors, um, we hear ever more argument about whose opinions deserve a platform and which are simply unacceptable and should not be published. And so I'm wondering where and how you think those lines should be drawn. You know, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm on, as you said, I'm on the editorial side of the Washington Post now, full-time employee, not a member of the editorial board, so I don't speak for Fred Hyatt. Um, uh, the editorial page editor, nor do I speak for Marty Barron, the editor of the paper. That said, you know, and, and, and maybe this is, I'm, I, I hope I'm not just being a homer here, but I, I think we have um, uh, at the Post, I, I think we, we're doing a fairly good job, uh, not only of policing the, the, the inseparable wall between news and opinion, but of, of um, of making choices about um, um, <clears throat> how we represent all points of view uh, on the editorial and op-ed pages without um, violating basic journalistic principles. Uh, and, uh, and 
And that is, um, that's really difficult in the Trump era. I mean, it really is. You could, you could, you can have, uh, you don't want an op-ed page that is strictly, you know, party line liberal um, uh, um, and, you know, a seller corridor um, sort of um, uh, worldview, right? And uh, we were lucky, have been lucky for a long time to have uh, some really outstanding conservative columnists, um, such as George Will, um, the late Charles Krauthammer, um, uh, and and a number of others, but but they were basically pretty much never Trumpers, right? And and so to find um, to find opinion writers who will defend uh, the, uh, the the Trump administration's point of view and uh, and its actions, um, without just telling huge whopping lies uh, or, or or crossing the line, is is just frankly not an easy thing. Now we we do have columnists who um, uh, who who. Uh, just in my opinion, not a member of the editorial board, who most of the time managed to do it. And like Mark Thiessen, for example, um, uh, who sticks up for the Trump administration uh, and only, you know, only occasionally wants me to, makes me want to tear out what's left of my hair. Um, but I remind myself that it's good that he's on the page um, and this and that. We have not had a lot of newsroom versus editorial conflict, certainly nothing like the open warfare that erupted at the Wall Street Journal over uh, the, the Hunter Biden story, for example, where um, uh, editorial wrote a piece, um, uh, in my view, completely tendentious and unmoored, um, uh, just buying the whole thing. And the newsroom did a piece saying, you know, not on your life. Um, uh, we haven't had that happen. Um, uh, uh, you know, um, so uh, I, I, I wish everyone did that as well as I think we do, do it at the Post. I'll just leave it there. <laughs> So now on the other, you know, on the other side of that equation, um, it was the Washington Post editor, Marty Baron, who famously declared early on, uh, we're not at war, we're at work. Mm -hmm. and, right. and yet we're operating, and he did it partly in response to administration that had, you know, publicly and then repeatedly declared reporters as the enemy of the people. And who the, as reporters pushed back about uh, statements that were not true, uh, leaned into fact checking, uh, that made it easier to frame not the Democrats as the enemy, but the media as the enemy. And we've heard about this as an explicit um, strategy mm -hmm. that has, in many cases, proven very effective. And so I'm wondering how you uh, would guide reporters in walking that line of um, being the fierce pursuers of truth um, wherever it takes them and yet not feeding into uh, the, the culture war um, that the president clearly wanted to wage or into an impression of the media as being, they are just out to get the president and the issues of what's true and what's not almost gets treated as a, as a sidelight to this battle between two sides. Right, well, look, I, I, you know, I think we have to, we have to be on the side of truth and, and on the side of journalism, right? That's who we're fighting for. And so if you wanna to go to war against truth and against journalism, um, then I don't mind fighting that battle, but, um, but I think Marty's point is, well, well taken. We don't want to be seen as being in in a war against the president of the United States. We want to be seen as standing up for truth and standing up for uh, for for journalism. And you have and and so I'm I I know that he would still say you know we're not at war we're we're at work. I also know that you know our our coverage has has appropriately evolved. I think, and, and uh, in in terms of 
characterizing um, uh, falsehoods and lies as falsehoods and lies, for example, which was very difficult at first. It's very hard to do. And, and writing stories in, uh, or at least seeking to write stories in a way uh, that does not uh, amplify falsehoods while refuting them. Um, uh, and, uh, and paying a special, uh, special attention to headlines uh, in that regard, because um, uh, as we know, a lot of people just read headlines and, uh, and, it's, and it's, it's, it's hard to do a lot of subtlety in, in, in headlines and, and often hard to, to, to make it clear that um, yes, the president did say it, but it is actually not true. Um, and um, so, so I think there has been an evolution in how, in, in how we how we write these things, and and in in our and to a certain extent in our reporting, um, and um, uh, and that evolution may continue depending on. But I mean, you know, I'm an opinion writer. I, he definitely lost me at Enemy of the People, right? It's like, okay, it's on. Uh, but uh, but I can afford to do that. I do a bit. Uh, we have a first question from one of our students. Uh, Anand has a question for you. Hi, uh, Ms. Gibbs. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, thank you so much, Mr. Robinson, for being here. Um, I guess. Uh, my question is sort of alluding to that both side ism uh, that you spoke to mm -hmm. in the yeah. discussion. Uh, and of course, you and a lot of other journalists have spoke up, spoken up about how this both side ism is sort of poisoning American uh, you know, political coverage. Uh, and there's been an increasing discussion on how um, late night comedians uh, have sort of become rock stars in this Trump era. Mm -hmm. uh, people like John Oliver, like Stephen Colbert, like uh, Samantha B or Trevor Noah, sort of because they uh, they break down those political topics pretty simply, and they they rarely, if ever, uh, have that both uh, that both sides discussion. Uh, sort of just making fun of uh, the president or lies and going straight to the facts. Uh, what role do you think late night comedy sort of has to play uh, in our political coverage? Uh, you know, it's a very good question. I mean, they look, they do. Um, I, I guess I see them as doing their thing and we do our thing. Um, I personally am really glad that they do their thing, right? Um, mm -hmm. Because number one, they're, they're, uh, they're very funny. Um, uh, and number two, they actually, you know, they do a lot of reporting. John Oliver does a lot of reporting and, um, or he and his producers do. Uh, and they, you know, they they um, uh, they they analyze things in uh, in interesting uh, and uh, and valuable ways. Um, uh, we're not there yet, and I don't think we should be. You know, I mean, I think we you know we we our role is is um, uh, we can't be that tendentious, um, um, and uh, sadly we can't be that entertaining. I think. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, next up is uh, Kiana. Hi, um, thank you so much for speaking today. It's been wonderful to listen. Um, I am wondering, you've spoken about the responsibility of uh, news organizations, and I'm wondering on the other end of that, I guess, what you would say is the responsibility of individuals who are receiving information mm -hmm. and news on a daily basis. What um, how do you how do you evaluate the truth value of any given piece of information, and you know what do you look for? What what would you give in terms of that kind of advice? Right. Well, you know, I think you should, you really should consider the source. You know, I mean, we really do have like a thousand really trained, experienced journalists who are you know who who kind of who really know what they're doing um, uh, and who are good at this and. Um, uh, and, um, uh, and I think it, 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 it's, I, I do think it's an individual responsibility to, um, um, uh, to at least, um, um, uh, be open to facts that don't necessarily support your worldview. 
Uh, and it's easily, it's, look, it's easy to live in a, in a universe of facts that only uh, support what you already believe. You can find those facts. And, and, um, uh, and I, I guess, um, I don't know what, but um, except um, um, uh, sort of, you know, how do you, how do you erode that if, if someone is determined um, only to, to, to listen to, a, to their own sort of set of facts, many of which are not actually factual. And I, I don't know any solution except sort of gradual erosion and, and, um, and, hope, and hoping that you'll eventually get through and knowing that to some people, it's just gonna be really, really difficult. I mean, I, you know, I, 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 <laughs> I was just thinking of a in back, remember back when we could take airplanes, we could get on airplanes and fly places. And I, I, I took one flight. Um, uh, I remember I was sitting next to a guy from um, New Jersey who owned some car dealerships, and he was a, you know, it, 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 he recognized me from television, and then it turned out he was a, he was a Trump supporter. Um, and, but he was like a chatty guy. So he really wanted to talk. And so, um, I, I kind of wanted to nap, but he wanted to talk. And so we ended up trying to talk and it was, and he watched Fox news all, every, all day, every day. And so we had nothing to talk about because we, because he would say something and I would say, well, but actually that never happened or that's not really true or this and that. And then I would say something and he would counter with his own version of truth. And, and it was very difficult to communicate and I'm supposed to be a professional communicator. And, you know, so it was frustrating. Uh, next is uh, Ryan. All right, hello. Uh, thank you so much for coming uh, to speak to, uh, to the forum tonight. Uh, my question pertains to, uh, I mean, specifically in, on November 3rd and in the days following it, uh, Mr. Robinson, you mentioned that at, as the Washington Post, it's, it's going to be your guys' obligation to, to get the facts to your readers. Uh, this kind of pertains to some of, the, uh, some of the things we've discussed before, but as the election is going to be uncertain and in, in the days following November 3rd, uh, there are going to be a lot of updates. How are you going to be able to make sure that the facts that you put out there uh, not only get to your readers, but disseminate into the wider community because people, uh, there are other news outlets uh, or mm -hmm. outlets that say that they're news outlets that are gonna be putting out things that run completely contrary uh, to what reality is. Right, so, um, I mean, I guess, you know, in, first of all, we just have to, we have to put it out there and we have to keep putting it out there and we have to keep repeating it and we have to, and, and we do have really, you know, pretty broad reach. And, um, but in part, that's what I would, you know, part of what I was talking about when I, when I said, um, we need, we may need to work together in ways that, um, that we're not accustomed to. And, um, and so responsible news organizations, um, I think if we have, uh, and a, an election, if, if things are uncertain uh, on November 4th and November 5th and November 6th, um, I think we ought to be talking to one another, um, news organizations, about what we know and what we don't know and what we can say and what we can't say um, uh, to present sort of more of a united front um, of of um, you know, trying to play it as straight as we can. Um, but um, uh, I, I worry a bit about um, uh, uh, sort of diffuse scattered voices um, from a lot of responsible news organizations versus a, a very loud unitary um, voice coming from the president and his allies saying something that's not true. And I think that needs to be countered by a more unified voice saying, telling the truth as we can, as, as we know it. And, and I think that's especially true if things are unsettled. 
uh, in the in the days after November third. It is not entirely clear that things will be unsettled. I mean, it, it it you know there are lots of scenarios, and some of them are looking more likely when um, you know even by very late on the you know the early the morning of the fourth or whatever um, we could we might be we could be able to call the election but we might not be able to call it for a long time and, and the longer it goes i think the more dangerous uh, the situation is and the more that responsible news organizations need to sort of speak with the united voice uh, next up is arjun hi thank you so much for speaking with us mr robinson and thank you for hosting this miss gibbs we talked a bit earlier about how people need to learn that just because a famous politician says something doesn't necessarily make it true. My question builds off of one posed earlier in asking when people have gotten so used to their existing these dual sources of information, both from politicians and from established news sources, how do we go about shifting culture back to being more critical about how people look at what information they choose to believe and what sources they choose to listen to? Um. Uh, um, um, better education. I don't, you know, I don't, I mean, I don't, I, I really don't know. Um, I mean, I talked a minute ago about this. It was a short flight I took with this New Jersey guy, but it seemed like a really long flight uh, uh, because of the conversation we we're trying to have. And, and at one point I said of President Trump, but, but he, but he lies all the time, you know. He says things that just are not true, and and I gave ex like any number of examples, and he said to me, "Yeah, but does that really matter?" And and okay, so I'm a journalist, right? Uh, I'm a pretty old school journalist because I'm old, and journalists tend to we tend to be, you know. OCD about um, about facts and about truth, and so yes, it matters. And 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 um, uh, and my head wanted to explode. Um, so that's a long way to say I, I really don't know. Um, I, I except um, I don't have a better idea right now than to just sort of keep at it, keep at it, keep at it. And um, uh, and and sometimes you know we'll maybe we'll, we won't break through all at once. I do believe, um, um, uh, you know, um, uh, I do believe that if President Trump were defeated in this election uh, and became former President Trump, um, just in my experience, um, um, I don't, Trumpism will not be the same without him. Um, I will still exist, uh, and he would still be a figure, but it wouldn't be, it won't be the same thing uh, um, without him uh, uh, occupying this position of, of power. Um, and that's just my experience and, and watching what happens um, uh, when, when leaders um, are deposed uh, and, um, uh, and how quickly they can, um, uh, they're power and influence uh, can fade. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm, I can't resist because we are, this is taking place virtually at a school of government and you have through <laughs> your career uh, encountered so many public officials in uh, who need to engage with the media and they need to engage successfully. And particularly moving forward into whatever new information environment we're all navigating, I'm wondering if you have some advice that you would offer to students who are looking to move into leadership roles about how they should engage successfully with journalists. Um, um, well, first of all, do engage with journalists <laughs> because um, uh, you know we only know what. Um, uh, uh, you know, we're only as good as our sources, and 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 if you know stuff that that people want to know and that we need to know to do our job, the only way we're going to find out is when you, is if you if you tell us, um, and um, uh, and and understand, uh, and I think most people who go into public, uh, um, well, you know, public service, um, either understand or learn. 
Um, <clears throat> you know, journalists are not um, there to be your buddies um, uh, and your friends, and they're not there to support your agenda, um, uh, or they or they they shouldn't be. Um, uh, so there are times when they'll be critical, and 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 uh, I would hope um, that you would embrace that and understand that that's uh, a necessary and valuable part of the of the process of our of our democracy, um, and um, and the best public servants I I know uh, have always done that. When um, uh, President Obama used to have um, uh, uh, columnists in for um, off the record uh, settings, and and uh, so you'd arrive at the White House and in the Roosevelt Room there along around the long table uh, there would be name cards at your at your place cards where you're supposed to sit and so you knew that if you uh if you were seated next to where the president was going to sit uh then he had a bone to pick with you um and so uh and you were going to catch hell and, and so what you know one time i went in and sure enough i was seated next to him and so i sat down and said okay i wonder what this is about um and it was during the edward snowden revelations and i had been astounded that um you know mr constitutional law professor barack obama had allowed this this process this this to continue of of uh the nsa gathering data on all of our phone calls our domestic phone calls i thought that was an outrage and so i wrote column several columns about that um and so um, the president started going around the table and took a question from somebody else. And, and, uh, and when he finished giving that answer, he looked around and said, anybody else? Um, and he turned to me and said, Gene, uh, gee, do you have any, uh, uh, any questions about the, uh, Orwellian police state that I'm running apparently? And, uh, and, uh, proceeded to uh, argue with me about uh, about the columns I had written. Um, uh, and I proceeded to explain why I thought I was right and I thought he was wrong. And um, I will note that he did eventually change the program. So, um, but um, but I think he did, I mean, he read everything and he did understand that, that um, my job wasn't to agree with him um, uh, necessarily. My job was um, to call it the way I saw it. Uh, I'm delighted to give the final question of the evening to one of my predecessors, the founding director of the Shorenstein, uh, uh, Marvin Kalb. <laughs> oh my. Well, thank you so very much, Nancy. Wow. But Jean, thank you so much for being our guest. Wow, it's been a terrific uh, evening. And wow. let me just ask you this question. Uh, you have spoken about us being at war. Mm -hmm. Uh, before Trump came to office, Fox News was already the number one cable news operation mm -hmm. in the country. Yeah. Since Trump, it has become even more so. It is a tremendous source of information. Yeah. Um, what is your fear that <clears throat> you spoke about fringes before? You said, let them be, let them stay with the fringe. But what if the fringe becomes the mainstream? Mm -hmm. What if Fox is where most people go to get their vision of truth? Does that make the question make sense? No, the question makes a lot of sense. And the question is, is uh, terrifying, Marvin. It really is. It, it, because, um, um, uh, because yes, if you, um, if, if you, click over to Fox News, as I do uh, um, pretty often, uh, you are entering a, a different universe. Um, I, um, you know, the best I can do is a kind of Pollyannish hope. Um, I, I think for the foreseeable future, um, Fox in primetime will be um, out there. Uh, and uh, I think, you know, it was pre-Trump, it will be post-Trump, um, uh, if there is a post-Trump, uh, and uh, 
Um, and, and so you'll have this huge lump of people who, uh, who, who watch Fox News and who inhabit that universe, and you will have a, a bunch of other people who, you know, who watch CNN, who watch MSNBC, who watch the other broadcast networks, um, uh, and live in a in a different universe. And um, and I guess I have a Pollyanna-ish hope that um, that that somehow. Uh, in the future, the, the the twain will at least begin to bleed into each other, and 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 maybe, um, uh, and maybe it will take a sort of um, Deus ex machina. You know, maybe it will take some um, some big event. You think maybe you know a global pandemic, say, would be big enough to you know to to sort of bring us together. That hasn't done it. But um, but but maybe it will take some sort of um, um, heaven forbid some sort of even bigger shock um, to to, um, to 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 put us closer to being on the same page. But I, I worry about that a lot because you know you 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 go to places in the country or you walk down the street really, and you know that there are people who just live in a different country. Than the one you live in, uh, where different stuff happened, uh, and and um, and different things are true, and uh, and you know that um, there's nothing you can do about that right now. So it's very scary. Eugene, I think so many uh, of us feel like we know you because we get to watch you, we get to read you. It has been an especial privilege for everyone tonight to get to engage with you. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts and your experience and your time with us. I'd also like to thank uh, the staffs of the Shorenstein Center and the Institute of Politics and the JFK Forum, and all of you who make the work that all of us do possible. There is a lot of work to be done. And Eugene, you've given us a lot to think about as we all go about our, our responsibilities as citizens in the days to come. So Godspeed, stay well, everyone, and thank you again. Well, thank you. Thanks so much, Nancy. Bye-bye.